Welcome back, everyone. I, I really am excited to introduce you all now to uh, Dan Kaplan, Farmer Dan, as he likes to be called. He's a lifelong meat lover whose favorite meal is a good burger. Founded at Hearthstone Farm due to his distrust of supermarket meat. Aspiring to be a farmer from his childhood in Kansas, Dan achieved this dream after a 45-year career as a serial entrepreneur. He has built, founded, built, and operated and sold companies in technology, media, marketing, and green energy sectors. Uh, now he's a farmer. Dream come true. Uh, Dan, we're excited to have you on the show. Welcome. We're thrilled to have you. Sorry, Dan. I apologize. I was I was hiding in the, out, out in the pasture there. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, welcome. Um, let me invite you to take it away here. Great, great. Well, thanks, Devin. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, as Devin mentioned, uh, um, I'm called Farmer Dan, and, and you all ought to call me that because that's what people know me as. Um, but like he said, before I was Farmer Dan, I was serial entrepreneur Dan. I've uh, spent 45 years being an entrepreneur, built a bunch of companies, uh, sold them. Um, and uh, the exits added up to over $300 million. You know, I loved my career and I was good at it. But to be honest, there was something missing. And to understand that, if you don't mind, I'd like you to travel back with me nearly 60 years. My family was living in Kansas at the time. I was 10 years old. And my best friend, David, lived two doors away. And every Sunday after church, David and his parents would drive out to visit his grandparents on the farm that his ancestors had homesteaded a century before. And one Sunday, he invited me along. And for the next three years, until my family moved away, I went with him every single Sunday. Now, the farm wasn't prosperous. This was in 1961, and the old farmhouse that they had still didn't have running water. I loved going there. I loved helping out with the chores. But you know what I really remember is this, the food. We had dinner in the afternoon at a big round table in the middle of the kitchen. I had never tasted food this good. It was fresh right from the farm. You know what I especially remember was the chicken. It was killed that morning. It was that fresh. And it was so good. And it was so flavorful. That childhood experience left me aspiring to be a farmer. It was a, like an itch that wouldn't go away. And so 10 years ago, after I'd sold my last business, my girlfriend and I bought a farm in Maine. That first year, we um, bought five cows and we followed all these regenerative practices. We moved them every day to a new pasture. We didn't apply fertilizer. The first year, four of the cows got pregnant and we ate the other one. And man, was she delicious. We shared the meat with friends and family, and they all said the same thing. So the next year, we bought more cows and started selling the meat. Well, one thing led to another. And like I said, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My team and I decided a year ago, we've got a big opportunity here to build not just a big business, but a true alternative meat supply chain that'll make a difference in something so fundamental and so existential as the food that we eat. There we go. So in a year, we've really built this business. We're, we're going full steam ahead. We have 17,000 customers, 50 partner farms. Our sales this year will be $5.8 million. Every single week, we're fulfilling 750 orders. We're up, our sales are up this year um, over uh, 150% year over year. Just trying to go to the next slide. Let's see. So here's the here's the problem right here. Bacon, meat, any kind of meat. It's in these kind of quarters. If, if consumers saw this, they wouldn't buy bacon, right? Um, these animals are in inhumane conditions. They're shot full of antibiotics and growth hormones. And it's just not right. They're looking for choices. They're getting wise. And we're seeing this in our sales and in, our, in, in crazy demand that we're experiencing. 
uh, with our business. What do we do? We source directly from farmers that we vet and curate, and we serve, we sell directly to consumers. In other words, we're bypassing the meat supply chain. And that meat supply chain is dominated by the big four meat producers. All of our meat from family farms currently in the Northeast, no antibiotics or growth hormones, the livestock's raised in inhumane in conditions. And as you can see in this picture, I am one of the people who goes and makes sure that's the case. I mentioned our sales are skyrocketing. Last September, as an example, we did under two hundred thousand dollars, and this year, this uh, we already at six hundred thousand dollars. A lot of reviews. We currently serve only fifteen states, and um, we have an experienced team. We've launched a crowdfunding opportunity, and just to wrap up, we're bringing ch change to the meat supply chain, change that's healthy, and we invite you to join us as a co-owner of Hearthstone Farm. Excellent, we're, we're, thank you very much. Great presentation, great presentation. Oh, um, we're, we're really th thrilled to have you here. Let me bring our, our, our judges into the room now so that they can ask you some questions. Uh, maybe we could begin with Tawana. Tawana, uh, do you have a question for Dan? I do, Farmer Dan. First of all, well done. I'm I'm a meat lover, so you you won my heart with some of those images. Um, Wait, my, come on, I've got a, a ribeye steak with your name oh, on it. Here. Don't play with me, Dan. Don't play. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in 15 How about states. A oh, see, see. <laughs> You're in 15 states currently. What's the plan for expansion and how do you maintain your values as you grow? Uh, two great questions there. So uh, we currently ship um, from our own uh, fulfillment and warehouse uh, here in Maine. But in order to expand nationwide, we'll be utilizing uh, third party logistics companies that we've already started working with so that we can get uh, you know, a center in New Jersey and a center in, um, you know, Salt Lake City that can serve uh, all the different parts of the country. And so we're setting those up um, as we speak. Um, the, in terms of the values, which are really to kind of work with smaller farms, you know, there's so many farms out there that are struggling and trying to find a way uh, and are committed to quality. I think that absolutely we have to, that's a, that's a key. If I think about what's our challenge, it's maintaining the quality and the standards because that's really what we're here for. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Leah, how about you? You got a question for Dan? Yes. So from Dan, you showed us a very interesting slide where we saw that in 2023, revenue growth was um, pretty flat, whereas in 2024, you grow your revenue pretty impressively, 154%. I'm wondering what change between 2023 and 2024 so you could really launch the business that quickly? Uh, the primary thing was an investment in marketing. Um, so we uh, are spending um, around $70,000 a month right now on um, advertising primarily on, on Meta and um Google, we've um, been able to get our uh, customer acquisition costs. I, I we're quite pleased with them. Um, they run around um, sixty-five to seventy dollars per customer. A and important to mention there is that our lifetime value for our customers is uh, north of seven hundred dollars. So, uh, and, and for many of them, it's over a thousand dollars. We about sixty percent of our business is subscriptions. Um, and subscription customers customers are over a thousand dollar lifetime value. So we can spend that sixty five dollars relatively easily and um, and and we think it's scalable. We're like I said, we're probably we're gaining around nine hundred new customers a month right now. Impressive. Yeah. Florence, what do you think? what What would you like to know from farmer Dan? Uh, yeah. Hi, Farmer Dan. Um, uh, you mentioned that the revenue, I think, for this year was 
million or that's what you're on track to do. Is that for your company solely or is that money that is now rev share uh, amongst your partners? Uh, and if it's not rev share, how do you pay your partners or the other farmers that you work with? Right. So, yeah, our um, we are. Uh, we buy wholesale from the other farmers. They're, they are our partners and, and we work closely with them, but the relationship is that we're buying their goods and we're selling their goods. So the $5.8 million is our um, revenue. Um, but, but really important, at least to me, is that we're paying um, our farmers significantly more than they would get in other markets. Farmers get a, a you know 14% on average of the food dollar, which is ridiculous. They're the producers. Um, we're uh, right now we're paying around 40% of uh, our revenue um, to the farmers. So um, I think that's a big part of it. We're really trying to kind of both serve consumers and farmers and, and that's a win-win. Thanks for that. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I wonder, uh, Leah, if you've got a follow-up question for Farmer Dan. Yes, it's actually the first time I'm hearing that customers are buying fresh meat online. Can you tell us who are your typical customers? Who are the people jumping into this new way of buying meat? Yeah, so <laughs> really um, fueled by the pandemic, right? Um, uh, our, our When there was a meat shortage, people went looking for like, well, where am I going to get my meat? And so I think that changed a lot of consumer habits um but um and and really what we're seeing 55 percent of the customers that we're gaining were previously buying meat at a supermarket and i think what's happening is that consumers are becoming increasingly aware of what that meat has or doesn't have and the conditions those animals were raised in and they're willing to, you know, we're really good at shipping meat. Um, you know, it, it, it's like a real, we take a lot of pride in that. And it's going to arrive at your door in great, you know, condition because people are nervous about it, right? So um, I think the consumers are becoming increasingly aware of that. And, you know, other, as they're buying groceries, as they're buying other things um, online as well. So, um we have some competitors that are doing really well that are helping us by, you know, marketing themselves as well. Excellent. Uh, Florence, do you have another question? Yeah, it's about the expansion opportunity. So I uh, also love meat as to what it is, but <laughs> there might be those who are also looking for like veggies. Um, and there are some competitors out there that do that. Um, uh, is that a market that you're looking to get into or are you solely meat focused? So um, absolutely. We're, we're looking for and have already, you know, for instance, we sell, um, uh, there's a company in Maine that makes gluten-free pies called the Maine Pie Company. We sell their pies. Um, we sell uh, uh, soups from a company called the Hurricane Soup Company, and they use our ground beef in it. Um, so we're looking for, uh, you know, extensions um, that uh, uh, fit. And um, absolutely, I think the next one for us is, is an obvious one is seafood that we're working on right now. Um that a lot of our customers who asked us for, but, um, you know, kind of like, is it butter? Is it desserts? Is it uh, things that all have a kind of a story to it? That's what's really important that it, that it's sourced, um, you know, from someplace that isn't a factory. Great. Uh, Tawana, do you have a final question? I do. What role does technology play in the farming practices, if any at all? Uh, technologies everywhere, every day, in, in all of it. Um, um, you know, um, I think there's a lot of kind of, um, what should I call it, uh, monitoring um, technology that we use uh, in, in, with all of the farms. Things as simple as, as uh, um, watching the weight of the animals as they grow. Um, there's a, a, a new device, for instance, that allows farmers to um, use their phone to uh, um, determine the weight of their animals, right? That's like uh, really, really helpful. Um, and of course, our business 
is completely technology driven. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Excellent. We've got some great questions now coming in from the audience. Uh, let me go to Jimmy John. He's asked uh, a, a trifecta here, but let's go one at a time. He says, is your goal to go nationwide like the other meat shippers like Butcher Box? So um, Butcher Box is a, a, a national um, operation that has is basically buying commodity product and and kind of marketing it as somewhat better that has a really uh you know we we would like to be nationwide to serve uh customers uh everywhere but it's really critical there's no purpose for us being in business if we're not sourcing from the farm uh and from farms that meet our standards and so just buying commodity meat that you sell to a consumer that's not the business um that we're in um should I answer the other questions? Well, let, let me read them just so okay. that everyone can hear them. But would you ever sell to the big four meat producers? <laughs> uh, there's, there's, uh, no. What would be the point? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be dismissive of the question. Um, no, because that would be, con you know, one of those uh, big four is owned by a Chinese family. Another is owned by a Brazilian family. Um, they are the problem. We are the solution. I, I no. Okay. Excellent. And then uh, the final question he asked out of this trifecta is, will you bring in supply from overseas? Uh, no, there's no need to. Uh, Butcher Box, for example, buys all of its grass-fed beef from Australia. It makes no sense to me. I can't even get that. Um, there's, uh, you, you know, why we would import, uh, meat into the United States, which we are doing, but not, we're not going to do that. Um, that, that's contrary to kind of the core mission, uh, that we have. Excellent. Uh, you know, uh, Jimmy's asked, uh, a whole other set of questions now, uh, says you'll, you'll need additional suppliers to grow. Uh, how will you manage all the farms to make sure they're following your standards? Um, with with uh, team members who uh, put eyes on that farm, who uh, ensure that they're meeting all of our standards. Um, you know, we've already expanded to 50 farms. We can expand to more. Um, we go and visit them. We spend time there. Um, we need to build our team. Obviously, that's part of our fundraising. Um, but, um, you know, we've hired people on our team who have done this in different capacities at other, um, uh, you, you know, places. So, um, we've really built a system for, I, you know, for really understanding what farms are doing and that they're meeting our protocols. One more thing, we require them to, uh, you know, fill out an affidavit and sign that, that the animals haven't gotten antibiotics or growth hormones. Excellent. Now we've got another question that's come in from uh, Ralph Mann, and I think we just have time for you to answer this. But he says, "Do you find that many of your investors from your crowdfunding campaign are actually customers?" Uh, almost a hundred percent. We, uh, I think we have three hundred and five investors so far. Uh, Two hundred seventy-five or so were uh, customers. It was so such a gratifying and really neat experience um to see that happen these are people who believe in us um and they're the owners uh, or at least co-owners and so I, th I think crowdfunding is great when you have loyal customers who really believe in you and, and that happened to us fantastic well dan thank you very very thank much uh, we're we're going to kind of step into the next phase of our presentation here. And so I'm, I'm going to, uh, um, we're, we're going to take a quick break, uh, but I, I want to invite everyone to take a minute to take a look at uh, the Start Engine campaign. You can scan, it, scan the QR code there with your phone uh, or just visit startengine.com and search for Hearthstone. Uh, you'll find uh, you'll find the offering there and be able to learn more about all the details uh, so that you can better understand 
uh, this offering. It's a really intriguing offer. Uh, I'm sure that you can appreciate. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, we're going to take a quick break.